Is this everything that there is, or is there more? The physicist Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington said, The stuff of the world is mind stuff. And now, 50 years later, quantum physics is validating that statement. Our universe exists within our own consciousness. I'm Ron, and welcome to Simplest State, where we explore creativity and the expression of consciousness in the lives of our guests. We have all seen his life-saving invention on the news, but few of us know what it's called or if it even has a name. It does, and it's aptly called the Bambi Bucket. It is the large, collapsible bucket that you see on the news as helicopters fill it with enormous quantities of water and then release it with incredible accuracy to douse wildfires. The Bambi Bucket brand is known globally and has become synonymous with aerial firefighting and is used in more than 115 countries. An astonishing 90% of helicopter firefighting utilizes the Bambi Bucket. It was even used to fight the post-explosion fires after the tragic blast at the port of Beirut, Lebanon, and was also used to cool the nuclear reactor after the tsunami tragedy in Fukushima, Japan. Don Arney, the man who invented the Bambi Bucket, is our guest today. Don is a resident of British Columbia, Canada, and is only the 14th Canadian to be inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in Washington, D.C. He is an inventor, a helicopter pilot, and a noted philanthropist that has practiced meditation for five decades to develop his mental potential and creativity. Don Arney, welcome to Simplest State, and thank you very much for being here. Thanks for the invitation, Ron. It's a pleasure having you. And I'd like to start right in, Don, on, on something that you had said. You had said at one point that you learned meditation in the course of your spiritual journey, which began when you found yourself sitting in the university library, wondering if facts are all there is. And indeed, you may have noticed that this podcast begins with a similar question. Is this all that there is? Would you like to tell us a little bit about your particular journey and what that question meant to you? Are facts all that there is? That was a question that kept coming to mind again and again and again. And I think you get to a point, especially when you're in university, where everything to do with the intellect is the main focus. When you sit there working on facts, memorizing facts, we all, we're all driven by the need for fulfillment, the need for satisfaction. Facts aren't that satisfying. And so what was missing was something far beyond facts, and that was a more profound meaning. I always think in terms of the little truth antenna that vibrates somewhere in our bodies. And for me, it went beyond truth. I didn't exactly know what I was looking for, but I knew what I wasn't looking for. And uh, so there had to be something more than what I was experiencing then. Every human being in one way or another is looking for that. And they just keep looking and not necessarily knowing what they're looking for, but they just keep looking until they find something that is ultimately satisfying. I think life brings it to you when you're ready for it. And for me, it was brought in a very unusual way. I was driving over the Canby Street Bridge in Vancouver, heading out to UBC, University of British Columbia. As I was driving off, there was a, a hitchhiker just off to the side, so I picked her up. So she was in the car all of five minutes. There was something very, very appealing. This wasn't on the level of a young man finding an attractive woman appealing. It was way beyond that. There was something about her that was really radiant. And she pointed out a couple of blocks ahead of where she wanted to get out. As we pulled over, I said, before you go, I've got to ask you a question. I hope I'm not out to embarrass you or anything like that. But there's about you 
something about you that's highly unusual and very, very appealing. And I'm very curious what that might be. She was very gracious and she said, well, there's something that I learned a few months ago that has had a very profound effect on my life. And I said, what was that? And she said, I learned to meditate. And I said, oh, really? And I said, so what's that about? And she said, well, I learned transcendental meditation. And she said, that's Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He's an Indian monk. And then I recalled at the university seeing posters around the university of his picture. But I never put two and two together. She made me very, very curious. And so I said, so where did you learn and how do you do this? And, and she told me where the TM Center was. And they give introductory talks on, I think it was Wednesday evening. And so I was down there Wednesday. There was about 40 of us in the audience. And this very young man came out uh, to give the talk. And I was amazed how composed he was because watching him in my shoes, how would I be up there in front of 40 people? And I don't think I would be anywhere near as composed as he was. He said, what we're going to talk about tonight is not a new thing. It's ancient. And just hearing that, I just knew right there that I had to learn to do this. I learned that weekend. And that became, that was the beginning of an adventure that's for me is now half a century old. Twice a day, every day. That's, that's my internal laboratory. I can't imagine doing what I do if I didn't have that tool, you know, it's, it's extremely profound. It's extremely satisfying. It's just so much a part of my life. It's, um, it's something I don't normally think about. It's just, it's very integrated into my, who I am and, and how I go about my days. I was quite struck by your story, Don, and the part where you said you were speaking about this accumulation of facts that you were gathering as a student. And of course, I think many of us experience that, and few of us are so acutely aware of it that it's just an accumulation of facts, and we keep building them up and remembering them. But these facts are in the container of knowledge, but nothing is being done to develop that container, which is consciousness itself. And I suppose that's what you were saying in a sense, that when you felt there was something more, did you find that meditation then addressed that concern of looking for something beyond the mere facts, beyond the mundane, tangible, physical elements that we commit to memory day in and day out? I can only compare to what it was like before I learned to do this and what it was like after. The thing about before and you realize this in retrospect, your life before is so limited. It's so much always on the point value, this very specific focus. Focus on this, you focus on this, and you focus on this. One thing I found very dissatisfying, dissatisfying is realizing then when I would focus in on the point value that I was losing myself. I was very aware that I was losing myself, my identity. And as soon as I would back off on uh, go broad view from the point value, the focusing, that I'd get some sense of myself back. When I sit down and I do my, uh, my meditation, my daily meditations in the morning and the evening, it's completely the opposite. It doesn't zoom into this little point anymore. This is huge expansion and, and the degree of expansion varies from meditation to meditation it's never the same when you have that sense of vast wholeness vast expansion there's a, a sense of satisfaction in that that's beyond words um, it's it's on the level of being infinitely fulfilling and infinitely satisfying it has an infinite pull to it so that once you experience that, perhaps only once or many times, you know that that's all that counts, that that's what, I, what you have to go back to. 
And again, it's on the meaning level. It's so inherently rich with meaning. That's the, uh, the huge attractive because I think we're actually hardwired as human beings to live that as a full-time reality. Once you start to experience that on a daily basis, you realize that that's the most important part of your day. That's the foundation for everything in the rest of your day. I know from my lifelong adoptive profession of inventing, it wasn't what I was planning to do, that's the way it turned out. It's all about creativity and where that creativity comes from and how do you tap that creativity. And basically having that tool, being able to meditate and go to that special place takes all the pressure off because, you know, a lot of creative people have spoken about and written about, you know, things like writer's block and all of this. And, oh, my God, what can I do to get rid of that, tap into that flow again to get to that special place where you feel like you're coming up with something useful? That automatically happens when you go to that place. So now in your day, whatever tasks you're addressing in the course of the day, if you get to a point where you're stumped, uh, you don't have to go headbutting that. Uh, you just be very relaxed about it. Just bring to whatever whatever degree of focus is apparent in the moment as you're going about working on it methodically, but not having an expectation that you're going to necessarily find the solution or the results. And you just know that when you go into that meditation, I say that from experience because I found again and again and again, I go into the meditation with no expectation of anything practical coming out of the meditation. But again and again, when I come out of the meditation, uh, solutions that I was looking for become, I've said many times before, they bubble up, they become more apparent. They just uh, flow into your awareness. So then you have an idea of what you need to do. And then what I like to do at that point is go out and be hands-on, go to the shop, work with something. And that's the other amazing thing I find again and again, that what came to me as a result of being in that very deep place in the meditation, seamlessly marries over into the world, the physical world around me in my shop. I'll have a a partial concept of a, a component or something like that. And, but it's, it's not the full thing in my mind. And so I've learned that if I just look around my environment and I'll just reach out and grab something. And in that is that's what I was thinking about. And it's not always specifically the thing that I pick up, but it'll be related to what I need to create. It brings an innocence to the whole process. And uh, what you soon realize is that it's really not you that's doing the inventing anyway. You're basically um, plucking something from the absolute that's already there. It, it, it's there in blueprint form. And so now the job of the inventor is to just manifest it, to bring it onto the, um, the, the manifest world around us. And so that's the process you engage in. It's a very rewarding process. The, the, the world around us that we engage in day to day is very, very small. And the absolute experience you find when, you're, when your consciousness can expand, there's no limit to it. It goes out to infinity. The world we live in has that aspect, but the inner world is infinitely more satisfying. The, the outer world, if it's, that's all you've got, it eventually drains you and never brings ultimate, ultimate satisfaction. Because of its, its inherent limitations. Its inherent limitations, yeah. I think as human beings, we're all meant to be living and breathing examples of nothing but infinite values. And whenever we have problems around us, uh, our personal problems around us or problems in the world. It's because there's limitations. Somewhere in that world, there's limitations. And whenever there's limitations, there's problems. And so the only way of ultimately getting rid of the problems is to get rid of the limitations. And so the simplest way 
is to go inside. And that's where all the answers are. It's, it's profound. Yeah. You did say at one point in some interview or article that I'd read that you felt that ideas come from the very deepest part of ourselves and that that's why you felt meditation was really an essential component in developing creativity. And listening to you now, describing how it's as if the ideas themselves are structured in the absolute and you just manifest them. It, it reminds me so much of something that Mozart famously said when he stated that he doesn't write the music. He just simply hears it and then records it. It's remarkable to me that on that profound level, your experience is identical virtually to what he had said. Yeah, because the, uh, what we are as human beings is ultimately, the word you just used, identical. You know, we're, we really are all identical and we are all ultimately doing the same things in our lives. When we go to that most creative spot, we're ultimately all going to the same place. There is only one absolute reality. There isn't one for John and one for Bob and one for Sally. In that sense, it's really no surprise at all that there's a commonality of experience between those who tap into that unmanifest consciousness or that unified field of consciousness. And everybody, uh, you, you, you look at all the people that in history that we all hear about and read about and everything that accomplished great things, they'll talk about their lives and their accomplishments. But when you get them on a deeper philosophical note, uh, they, they all say, almost all say the same thing, that there's a profound place that I go to or that comes to me from time to time. And experiencing that ch profoundly changes my outlook on life. The, the thing is that for most people, it's a very mercurial process. It's very random how often it's going to come. When it floods in on any given person, and they have that deep experience, and then they come out of it, they get back drawn, to, drawn back to their normal life, it can almost be agony for them. Uh, having experienced that infinite perception to no longer have access to it is uh, very hard to live with. And so that's the beauty of something like what I've been doing all these years, Transcendental Meditation that it's not a random process. I, I know that when I get up in the morning, I'm going to do that and go there. And I know that in the evening as well. You know, so I feel very, very fortunate that I picked up that lady off, coming off the bridge. But life brings, uh, I, I believe really that uh, when you're ready for a new experience, life will find some way of bringing you that information, that knowledge that you need. That reminds me so much of a, a quote by an inventor that you would certainly be familiar with. A great author, the inventor of the geodesic dome, a brilliant mind, a great philanthropist, uh, Buckminster mm -hmm. Fuller. And he said, paraphrasing here, but it was something to the effect of how often I've found out where I was going only by starting out for somewhere else. Which takes me to the idea, too, that you said you got the idea for the Bambi bucket while you were testing the strength of underwater airbag. And you had the thought, how can I modify this? What do I need to do in order to make it useful for firefighting? The question I'm wondering is, why firefighting? Where did that idea come from? I mean, you were testing an airbag, presumably for lifting heavy objects out of the water, I presume, sunken vessels or lifting whatever. Lifting them underwater, yeah. They were, they're they're yeah, used in right. underwater construction, underwater salvage, and so forth. So then I thought, well, why would you be thinking of firefighting? What, what was the connection there? Was there anything? Well, I've always had a lifelong interest in aviation. I got my regular pilot's license in 1976, fixed wing. I was one of the first people in Canada to uh, hang glide. I was the first or second person in Canada to uh, own, build and own an ultralight. And so there were, I I've always been fascinated with anything aerial. 
and having had hands-on experience building aircraft and everything, and you know that every ounce counts uh, when you're building an aircraft. So in the case of the airbags, the way we would test them, like normally, they're like a big bag with a small mouth underwater, and you put the air hose in the hole at the bottom and fill it with air, and that gives you the buoyancy to, for it to do its job. So we're testing a 20 metric ton bag, so 22,000 pounds of water, and the bag itself only weighed 60 or 70 pounds. And so I was amazed at the ratio of what it was containing, the weight of the water, and compared to the weight of the, car, the container, the bag. That's what got my mind going, just that efficiency and seeing it hanging there upside down. I wasn't the first person to invent a firefighting bucket, but the, the original fire buckets were basically just 40 gallon drums with a dump valve fitted into the bottom and, you know, very crude. And then they came out with more refined ones, but they were still ultimately very crude. You're right. The way you described it, my mind went to what could I do there? Well, I'm going to make it much smaller because I was thinking of a, a bucket that would go on a Belgian Ranger or something like that. And so I shrink it right down, make it a little wider at the top. But I knew the major challenge was to make it dump the water. I went home with that in mind. And in the course of one evening, I wrote a list of all the different things that had to be solved. And just was easy about it. And then the answers just came just like a deck of cards, card by card, like that, until all the questions had answers. Of course, that was all mind stuff, you know, intellectual. And so then the next challenge was taking all those concepts and making them work in a, in a shop, you know, so that uh, it would actually dump water. But the amazing thing was that as the answers came, there was very profound aspects to the answers that flowed. Because one of the problems that existed with all of, didn't matter what brand of the existing water bucket a, a, a helicopter operator would go out and buy, they had one thing in common, and that was to dump. They had to lift the dump valve up through the water. So everybody's had the experience of sitting in a bathtub full of water and you've got an ordinary rubber plug in the bottom. Pulling that out when the bathtub's nearly empty is a lot easier than when it's full because you've got the head pressure of the water above the valve and water is very heavy. And so the answer that, uh, or the solution that I envisioned for the dump valve of the Bambi bucket ultimately did not fight gravity to dump. It worked with gravity to dump. That was, at the time, that was completely revolutionary. And when we did the patent searches, there was no other valve that's ever been invented for any application that worked the way that the dump valve in the original Bambi bucket worked. And so what did that mean in terms of making it better? Well, when you've got complexity, and, and effort and all of that, which all the valves that were being used at the time had, that meant they took more electrical power to open. It uh, made them less reliable. And it also made it harder to be a, a good firefighting pilot. Because imagine, like, typically when a pilot is fighting a fire, he's going to dump his water around 40 knots airspeed. When he's approaching his bullseye on the fire where he wants the water to go, he has to, in his mind, decide, okay, I'm moving at 40 knots, so that water's going to have, once it ejects from the bucket, it's going to have its own trajectory. And so I have to dump at a certain time that's going to, he has to factor in the time it's going to take the valve to open before he's got a full flow of water. And then once that happens, then the water's got to hit the fire. That's a very difficult thing to do. It takes a lot of um, experience for a pilot to be able to accomplish that and, and to be able to do it again and again reliably. What pilots very readily found, you could take somebody with very little experience fighting fires, a very green pilot perhaps, and he goes out and looks like a pro just because he's using a bandy bucket. Well, when 
the Bambi bucket went out and started uh, getting into the hands of pilots, they would just use it a couple of times. Right then and there, they just knew that they were going to use any of the product because it was so revolutionary and made them look so good. And then, of course, they did all the other things that the market was looking for. One of the logistical considerations is fire might be 100 miles away from where the helicopter is stationed. How do we get the helicopter and the fire bucket to the fire? Well, the last thing you want to do is fly it outside the aircraft, hanging from the helicopter, because that's going to slow the helicopter down. A lot of the buckets, that was your only option because you couldn't collapse it to put it in the helicopter to transport it. The Bambi bucket readily collapsed just down to the size of a set of golf balls. So it could literally go into the trunk of the helicopter and leave the rest of the helicopter free for crew or gear and this sort of thing. So it, it had about it had all these attributes that I didn't deliberately design into the product. They were all part of what just flowed out incrementally when I was just focused on solving one part problem. That was how to make this bag dump. Uh, one thing that uh, was very interesting uh, in the first year of the, ba- the Bambi Bucket's life is we did a joint venture with Okanagan Helicopters in Richmond, British Columbia, because we needed a partner to adopt the product and use it on their helicopters in, in a real firefighting situation, on actual fires. We did a demo for Okanagan Helicopters, and that went really, really well. The amazing thing was that when we did that demo, it turned out there's one key individual that wasn't there, and that was the head of firefighting for Okanagan Helicopters. And he and was actually back east uh, at the headquarters of the Canadian Forest Service, brainstorming with their scientists, their engineers, their technicians on the whole industry, Canadian Forestry Service, the U.S. Forest Service, They've been actively petitioning helicopter operators saying, these are all the deficiencies in your current buckets. We want to see those, all these problems solved. But helicopter operators, well, we're, we're not engineers, inventors, and everything like that. Why should that be our problem? The Canadian Forestry Service figured, well, at least let's draft up the features that we envision being in our perfect bucket. And so they, they drafted up a list of 12 features. So after we had a few sessions with Okanagan Helicopters, the fellow who was in charge of firefighting, firefighting had come back, and he couldn't believe that a new kid on the block had just shown up uh, with a new firefighting bucket. Like when he'd just been out there laboring on this exercise with all these other people, he said, do a demo for me. And we went into a demo for him. And then he immediately called everybody and they all came out. All 12 of them flew out. And we did another demonstration. And then we took the bucket into the hangar and we did a debriefing. And they brought out their list of 12 features and we started going through them. So the Bambi bucket had all 12 features and two they hadn't thought of. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah. And so... That's an intelligence far greater than my limited intelligence at work. Because I was focused on one aspect of it. But, you know, the amazing thing about expanded values, like if you go and take one little chunk of infinity and bring it to you, if you could ever do that, and you could open up your hands and look at what you just grabbed, it too would be infinity. When you're solving problems on this level, you just get a portion of the the ultimate answer that you're looking for, and that's enough to bring you everything. That's a beautiful thought. Because, yes, when you you take a portion of infinity, then you have infinity within that portion. That's right. That's right. So, so, So the same thing goes with problems. If you go to that place for the solution, you don't have to come out with a full answer. You come out with even a tiny little piece of the answer and go to work on that. And that little piece will expand to the full answer. But you've got to go to that special place 
where the portion of the answer has that value, that ultimate value in it, to allow it to expand to its fullness in everyday life. Is that what you mean, Don, when you have said in the past that there is elegance in simplicity? There is elegance in simplicity. And uh, one person that I admire greatly, you know, was Elon Musk. I had got my first Tesla in 2014. Elon is famous for saying the best part is no part. One of the things engineers will do, either from habit or poor work habits, perhaps, I don't know, is they'll unnecessarily design parts in there based on the assumption they're required, they're, they're necessary for whatever you're creating to work. I found in design and in business uh, at large, it, it's very unwise to um, move forward based on assumptions. You have to go back to first principles. That can be really difficult to do. You can, you can, do it, you can basically do it the hard way or the easy way. To do it the hard way is to uh, be extremely disciplined that you are, in fact, going back to first principles, that you're not making assumptions and all of that, or you go back to that infinite reservoir of creativity and spend some time there and do it in a very innocent way. Like you're not there to specifically solve a problem. You're only there to be there and not do anything specific. You're just there to be there. And you leave there, but that intelligence that's there knows what's up in your life right now, you know, what you're focused on and everything like that. And so you come back and you re-engage, which is totally natural. And then that flow is kicked in because everything about you has been kind of lubricated by the experience of being in that other expanded state. It's really the only way to uh, go about life because otherwise it's just an exercise in frustration, really. Every human being just wants to be satisfied and to be more fulfilled day by day. So it's nice to be able to have that opportunity in your life to have a facilitator of that in your life. I'm fascinated by the fact that you seem to have found a way to integrate what are apparently opposite values. You have, on the one hand, consciousness, which is abstract, not tangible, not physical. And you live in a realm of facts and figures and details and engineering algorithms and the constraints of mathematics. And yet, you find that those two things actually support each other. Uh, they're, they're basically like two sides of the same coin. The thing that comes with time is that when you're used to going to that expanded state, you use the word integration, so that expanded state integrates into your life. You know, you said the, the algorithms and facts and figures and all of that are, are day-to-day world. So those values come out and become part of that day-to-day world. And so you lose your reliance on those tools where you, you're going to perhaps calculate the weight or, or volume of something and how re- resistant to where is it and all of these things. Those are all very important things to do. But what's ultimately more important is that when you're pursuing a solution, uh, if you're trying to develop, say, a new product or something like that, is to get that expanded view of what that product is all about. And then all that other stuff, the calculating of the weights and, and the elasticity or whatever it is that you've got to address from an engineering perspective, basically becomes like a housekeeping function. You know you're going to have to do that at some point. But the satisfying part is to get the, uh, the full picture, the, um, the total perception of what the product is. And again, the amazing thing, and it bears repeating, is that you don't have to have that aha in its entirety. You just need a portion of the aha, and that's enough. And then you just have to spend time with the idea and it if it's got that ultimate 
infinite value within it in terms of being the best solution, then it, it has no choice. It's its nature to expand before you. The other way of doing it through hard engineering and slide rules or computers and all of this, that's the old way of doing it. A lot of people refer to it as incremental engineering. You know, like we build up these amazing technologies. You know, you look at, say, the world of batteries. You look, there, there were electric cars 100 years ago, 90 years ago. But the batteries that we used back then were very unsophisticated compared to what we're using now. And what we see is uh, basically a century, century of innovation, incremental improvements. And we see this in so many professions. We see this in medicine, and basically everything. You know, you go buy yourself a new cell phone. It's incrementally better than the model preceding it. It's not a, a new paradigm in cell phones. So the same thing with products. If everybody had the opportunity, well, everybody does have the opportunity to do this, but if everybody's aware of it and decided for themselves, oh, I want to adopt this tool. If everybody did that, we'd have such a profoundly different world because there'd be way less bad stuff in the world and there'd be infinitely more good stuff in the world. And we'd have so many more people happy in achieving things in their lives that brings them joy. Over the years I've been meditating, there have been so many people that I've crossed paths with that want to talk to me about it. And so, fine. I'm happy to talk about it. And then they make choices for themselves. Well, I'd like to try this. And it is just, it never ceases to amaze me uh, when I watch them change from this one simple little thing. And it's so fast. It's almost digital. Within days, you start to see the changes. One person that I explained this meditation to, she decided she wanted to learn it. And I didn't that, know this person previously. And uh, she learned. And she explained to me that she'd had trauma early in her life that she'd never resolved. And uh, within something like two to three weeks of learning to meditate, she said it was just like the log jam just broke. She just started seeing all these revelations in her life that uh, revolved around this log jam. And, and she said the simplest thing it was that she didn't have to do anything. She'd been taking counseling and all these things. She didn't have to go and work on all these things at all. She just had to enjoy her two, two, day, two, two daily meditations. All this change just came about from that, that one simple thing. When you see something like this happening again and again and again and again in your life and the people around you that do it, you're moved because how can something so simple be so profound? And it is, you know, because ultimately it is so simple. The most profound things in life ultimately are simple. A lot of people, when they've been wrestling with a problem for years, when the answer finally comes to them, they can find it humorous that they wrestled with an issue for so many years. And when they ultimately find the answer, it was insanely simple, the answer. Like, so obvious, how could I not have seen that? The stress kind of plugs us up. When you meditate, you get rid of stress. Hundreds and hundreds of scientific studies that show it's the most powerful antidote to stress that scientists have ever researched. It's like a person who's driving a car all the time with a foot on the brake and, and what, realizing why the car is using so much gas and is so doggy. Well, get your foot off the brake. And, and uh, that's what meditating does. It, the blocks in the nervous system that are stopping you from functioning in a vastly superior way are just um, very innocently resolved and removed. You know, when you look at the costs in society, like, the biggest line item in a, in a government's budget is uh, spent one way or another on in healthcare or the, the effects in society of poor health and all of that. And so if the objective is to um, solve that problem, the solution exists right now. 
They, in fact, don't have to go out and solve the problem because there is a solution. And uh, the solution is just encouraging people uh, to go and adopt this tool for themselves. You know, it should be subsidized. Teach people to do this because it would ultimately save huge amounts of money, you know, and eliminate huge amounts of suffering. When I listen to you, it keeps reminding me of what quantum physics says about it. Consciousness being an underlying field, a unified field that brings together all the other four fundamental forces of nature. It highlights what I mentioned in the introduction, as Sir Arthur Eddington said, the stuff of the world is mind stuff. The reason I say that is because, from what you're saying, just the practice of meditation, which is not doing anything on the manifest or expressed active level of life, but simply on the level of consciousness itself, yet it has an enlivening and beneficial effect on all the other aspects of life. Well, it only makes sense because um, it is all ultimately mind stuff. And that is something that become, you become very aware of uh, when you transcend. Transcendental meditation, meditation to think, transcend to go beyond. The name is its definition. And, and describes how it's done so that when you transcend and you go to that unbounded field of mind stuff, you realize that that is, in fact, all we're made of. So we are that mind stuff. So where is the journey? Well, the journey is going from point A to point A. Your destination is where you left from. It's one and the same thing. There's one more example of when you make realizations. Uh, when I say realizations, meaning when you stumble upon truths or truths become evident to you, their profundity is in their simplicity. When I meditate each day, I, I don't come out of every meditation with some profound insight or anything like that but I do come out with an ongoing assuredness that everything in act, our active world has this continuum of interconnectedness. Nothing can be lost by being one place when you should be somewhere else because it's all part and parcel of the same continuum. If you're plugged into one aspect of it, on that level, you're plugged into every aspect of it in, in, in the real world. That's the beauty of mind stuff, the lack of boundaries. There's a super fluid aspect to it all as well. Everything is moving at infinite speed, at infinite frequency. It's, it's extremely inviting. Again, it comes back, to like, why would it be inviting? It's inviting because it is who we are. We're just going back and it's, it all comes down to just revolving around our own internal view of our reality in the second or the moment or the microsecond. That it's all mind stuff is an amazing perception. And the, th the thing is that when you're experiencing it in your meditations and everything, you know, when you speak those words, mind stuff and if you're not used to hearing that kind of stuff, it sounds very abstract. But the more you do experience it for yourself, the more concrete it becomes. Well, I think, I think you've put your finger right on it there. Right. I think for most people, that whole concept is just fanciful philosophy. Uh, when you say, what does that mean? The stuff of the world is mind stuff. Mm -hmm. Everything is consciousness. It has no real significance or meaning to them. You are one of those few rare and fortunate individuals who actually have that direct experience in your daily life. I, I wish more people, as I say, uh, could experience that for themselves. Clearly the benefits are very well documented, and you've explained beautifully how taking recourse to the quiet level of consciousness allows you to come out and be more creative, more innovative, more inventive, to find solutions to problems that you've been grappling with in the world of engineering and invention. In terms of your perspective, 
that this broader vision, this more unifying perspective that you now have on life, has it affected your life or your happiness in other ways other than your professional uh, pursuits of, of development and invention? The word that comes to mind is holistic. I can give you specific examples. You drive 30 miles and then you go to a movie. It's a great adventure, it's funnier, it's whatever it is that you enjoy. What I found changes, the most profound change, is being happy for no reason. We're used to being happy for a reason. Well, how about being happy for no reason? That is something that is so infinitely satisfying because to have to go out and look for a reason to be happy, (laughs) that's going to make you unhappy because you know if you don't find that reason, you won't be happy. I think what you're saying is that you're becoming more subject-oriented and less object-oriented. In other words, that trip to town to see the movie is no longer centered on the goal of seeing the movie. Every moment of the journey is as equally joyful as arriving at the goal. Yeah, the movie's the icing on the cake. And even when you're watching the movie, the same processes at work is still happening, where there's this underlying happiness. The fact that it's there elevates all your activity. Uh, I'll go and see the movie, and other people might say, well, that was a pretty dumb movie, (laughs) blah, blah, blah. I can watch a movie that the critics might say is 19% or something like that. And I find all these little islands of happening through the movies that's very enjoyable. I'm not dependent on the movie being 99 out of 100 to feel good about the movie. A greater appreciation in general of the world around you. Exactly. Yeah. And so the same thing applies to uh, people. A common human trait is to be critical. I found just over time that that's a waste of life. To be doing something like that doesn't work at all for making me happy. So there's so many aspects of our life are affected because this underlies every aspect of life. Well, Don, you've been generous with your time. And I want to close by pointing out that since the Bambi bucket, you've gone far beyond that. You've invented the yak track, which adds tank-like tracks to, to SUVs and pickup trucks. The hangboard, which suspends a rider in a horizontal position so they as if fly down the ski slope. You have the jet net, which is a remote-operated self-propelled vehicle to rescue people who are in distress in the water. What's next for Don Arney? <laughs> That's the question I'm always asking myself. Right now, I'm working with a small team of engineers. We have our own little skunk works. We have around five distinct products in development. I'm very hopeful that they have a willing, ready market waiting for us. I always like to focus on products that will be pulled into the market rather than spending time developing iffy products that have to be pushed into the market, like a new brand, new flavor of toothpaste that has to be pushed into the marketplace. The Bambi bucket is a classic example of something that was very much pulled into the marketplace because there was this, a, a very obvious need for that product. So the right product at the right time. When I look at the different products that I've come up with over the years, they've usually been a result of observing something going on in my environment. I'll watch somebody doing something. I see that it's not particularly efficient or precise. There's some major stuff missing from the equation. I just ask myself, well, what's the missing stuff, you know, to to make this better? That's the the inventive process. So that's a process that I find very rewarding. You mentioned earlier my role is in philanthropy. 
what is the goal for any one person? Uh, any one individual only needs so much money to be living comfortably and everything like that. There's uh, so many issues in the world today that can be solved with very profound knowledge, such as we've been talking about. The only barrier is money. So I would like to continue to be able to support that in a much grander way than I currently do. And my business partner feels exactly the same way. We're a great team. The way you make life better is just by going out and doing something. You know, it does, doesn't matter how much, it doesn't matter how profound. Just go out and do something and try and make something, any little thing better than it was before. And that's how we measure a, a, a human life. And you can't blame the person if they didn't, because some people, their entire bandwidth is taken up uh, living their life and dealing with their problems. We'd like to solve that too, wouldn't we? So that every person can go out and make what you or I would say, that's, that's, a, that's a profound solution. We're living in very trying times. We need very profound solutions to make the world a better place. Not the, not the same old, same old. But I think the world's very, very ready for that. Soon, profound new knowledge is going to truly become mainstream. and It won't be fringe. It won't be esoteric. It'll become mainstream. And that'll be a very beautiful thing. I'm an optimistic person. I think that better days are ahead in spite of everything we're seeing going on right now. When we make that transition, it'll be a very beautiful world. Everybody can be an inventor in their own way, invent new things in their life, invent new directions in their life. And remember Doug Henning, you know, the magician? He used to always be alluding to magic and then there's magic that's just trickery what a magician does and then there's real magic and the real magic comes from that profound reservoir in every human being that profound infinite reservoir in every human being this is what the world needs now is it needs magic uh, it needs more magic real magic very well said, Don. Thank you. A beautiful note to end on. And like you, I am optimistic, and I do feel the world is ripe for greater knowledge. And I think that is becoming more and more apparent. And we see that more and more, that people mm -hmm. are waking up to the fact that there is more to life than just eat, sleep, go to work. There is something more. There is a reservoir of energy and intelligence within us and with proper techniques or with proper attention, we can develop that and express that in our daily lives. And I think you've done that beautifully today. And I thank you so much, Don, for being on Simplest State. Thank you. It was absolutely a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.